Baik pemirsa KMNQ Corpu TV, baru saja kita saksikan Trade Conference Session 1 Introductory Remarks dengan pembicara Christine Lagarde, Managing Director IMF, lalu juga ada Jim Yong Kim, Presiden World Bank Group, lalu Roberto Azevedo, Director General World Trade Organization, dan Angel Guria, Secretary General Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Menarik sekali apa yang disampaikan pada konferensi tadi dan apabila Anda tertinggal tayangan event tadi ataupun event-event sebelumnya, jangan khawatir. Anda dapat menyaksikan semua tayangan tersebut dengan mengakses akun YouTube kami di BPPK Kemenq RI. Sekali lagi, dengan mengakses akun YouTube kami di BPPK Kemenq RI. Selanjutnya kita akan melangkah ke event berikutnya yaitu A Public Sector Balance It Approach to Public Wealth, What Does It Mean in Practice Seminar. Paparan ini berisi sebuah analisa neraca sektor publik di seluruh dunia yang kemudian dihubungkan dengan penerapannya di Indonesia dan lebih lanjut menggambarkan bagaimana sebuah paket kebijakan dapat meningkatkan kesejahteraan dalam jangka menengah. Paparan ini akan disampaikan oleh John Rally dan Pak Hawa Jaskau sebagai moderator. Baik pemirsa KMNQ Corpu TV dari kawasan Nusa Dua Bali, kami ucapkan selamat menyaksikan. Attention ladies and gentlemen, our next session will begin soon, so please enter the ballroom. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session will begin soon, so please enter the ballroom. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the last presentation of the analytical corner of the 2018 annual meetings. My name is Pakawa Jeskun, economist at the IMF. I would like to briefly mention about housekeeping rule. First, please silence your cell phone. In terms of formatting, um, our presenter will take the first 20 minutes to make a presentation. And after that, we will open the floor for Q&A. This session is about public finance. Sound public finance is fundamental to overall macro financial stability. Standard fiscal policy analysis when assessing the government's financial health typically focus on debt and deficits. The analysis of public sector balance sheet 
can complement the standard approach and can provide a more comprehensive assessment of public finance. This morning, we have John Lawyer, Senior Economist at the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. John will tell us more about the public sector balance sheet approach. Please join me to welcome John. Thanks, Pastor. Good morning. In deciding whether to invest in a new house or car, how much to save for retirement, or to put forward to your, your or your children's education, do you only consider your debts when making that financial decision? If so, your analysis may go something like this. I owe 100000 on my house, therefore I cannot afford to save for retirement. Or perhaps worse, I owe 100000 on my house, borrowing another 10000 for a new car is no big deal. At a minimum, the analysis seems incomplete. Hopefully, you include your assets and your future income and expenses when making your financial decision. However, this is not a talk about personal financial management. As the title implies, it's about using public sector balance sheets to improve fiscal policy analysis and decisions. Three questions will guide the presentation. First, what is a public sector balance sheet? Second, why bother with one? And third, how to use the public sector balance sheet approach for better, for better policy analysis. To use the balance sheet approach, we first need a public sector balance sheet. Let's make one for Indonesia. Up on the screen, you see the framework for a balance sheet, which is divided into two parts. Assets, what the government owns, go on <coughs> will go on the uh, right, left-hand side of the balance sheet, and liabilities, what the government owes, will go on the right hand, left-hand side of the balance sheet. We can start by building the asset side first. In Indonesia, financial assets amount to about 50% of GDP. And the majority of these assets are held by Indonesia's commercial uh, public sector banks in the form of loans. However, Indonesia's largest public sector asset is its natural resources of holdings of oil, gas, coal, and other minerals. These assets are substantial at 60% of GDP, However, they have been declining over time as Indonesia extracts primarily its oil from the ground. To these items, we include the value of infrastructure, such as roads, roads, buildings, and ports. And finally, we add in land and other assets. As you can see, Indonesia's Total public sector assets are quite large at 165% of GDP. We now turn to the liability side. Let's start with government debt. In Indonesia, in 2016, government debt was 32% of GDP. However, debt is not the only obligations that governments have. For Indonesia, other liabilities at 40% of GDP were actually greater than its government debt. The attentive listener, who is quick with math, will have noted that Indonesia's public sector liabilities at 72% of GDP are, are smaller than its assets. The difference between the public sector assets and liabilities is balance sheet net worth, which in Indonesia's case was 93% of GDP in 2016. Not too bad. However, the story is not complete. In, <clears throat> in making personal financial decisions, recall that it is a good idea to consider future flows of your income and expenses. In a similar fashion, in the balance sheet approach, we consider 
the future flows of general government primary revenues and expenditures. For Indonesia, the value of these future flows were about negative 91% of GDP in 2016. This means that on current fiscal policies, the cumulative value of Indonesia's expenditures exceeds its revenues. Public wealth, Indonesia's public wealth, combines the uh, current future flows, which we will call the intertemporal component, with public sector net worth. In Indonesia's case, in 2016, therefore, its public wealth, on an intertemporal sense, was 2% of GDP. Great. We have just created an intertemporal public sector balance sheet for Indonesia, to which we will return in a bit. For now, I'd like to highlight some reasons why we took the time and effort to build such a balance sheet. Consider that in standard fiscal policy analysis, the assessment of balance sheet items is generally limited to gross debt. As in the personal financial analogy, only focusing on what the government owes can lead to suboptimal decisions. The balance sheet approach, which encompasses both public sector assets and liabilities, complements the standard approach by offering a more comprehensive view of public finances and the impact of fiscal decisions on those finances. There are at least four other reasons to use the balance sheet approach. One, as we saw in the case of Indonesia, public sector assets can be material. The IMS fiscal monitor launched earlier today shows that for a sample of countries covering 60% of the world's GDP, public sector assets totaled 102 trillion US dollars. The fiscal monitor also shows that better management of those assets can yield up to 3% of GDP in additional revenue for those countries. Clearly, assets are worth, worth keeping track of. Two, another reason to embrace, embrace the balance sheet approach is that balance sheet strength matters. Countries with stronger balance sheets generally enjoy lower financing costs and shorter and shallower recoveries from recessions. Three, the balance sheet approach can lend additional transparency to fiscal policy. As we noted in the case of Indonesia, the extraction of oil from the ground actually reduces natural resource wealth. This is an element that might be missed in standard fiscal policy analysis. And the fourth argument in favor of the balance sheet approach is that it can yield or allows for more deeper risk assessments. For example, with the balance sheet approach, one could assess the impact of macroeconomic shocks on government assets, such as those held in sovereign wealth funds. However, as you likely suspect, views of the public sector balance sheet approach are not all one-sided. To be balanced, I must note that the approach has some limitations. Data quality and availability can be an issue. Asset valuations can be quite tricky, tricky particularly for non-financial assets, including natural resources. In addition, asset values can be quite volatile and many assets tend to be illiquid, which means that they're not available for short to cover short-term financing needs. And critically, the conclusions reached under the approach, as in most analysis, depends on the quality of assumptions that go into the analysis, an issue which gains prominence when projecting long-run revenue and expenditures, as in the case of the intertemporal balance sheet. Okay, now that we have a basic understanding of balance sheets and their strengths and limitations, 
let's put one to use. Indonesia's current fiscal policy considerations provide an excellent case study. Like most countries, Indonesia faces large public investment needs. The World Bank has estimated that Indonesia loses up to 1% of GDP per year due to inadequate infrastructure. The Indone rec in recognition of this shortfall, the Indonesian authorities have embarked on an ambitious infrastructure development plan to be partly financed by an increase in tax revenues as the authorities implement their medium-term revenue strategy. Is tax finance public investment a good idea for Indonesia? To answer this question, the analysis proceeds in three stages. The good news here is that we've already completed the first stage, which is the creation of an intertemporal public sector balance sheet for Indonesia. With the baseline balance sheet in hand, we can quickly proceed to the second stage. And this stage is where we actually assess the impact of that tax-financed public investment on Indonesia's output and public wealth. In this stage, an economic model calibrated for Indonesia is employed to simulate the effects of such a fiscal policy strategy on Indonesia's economy. There are several critical assumptions that go into the model. I'll highlight just a few. First, general government tax revenue is assumed to increase a cumulative 3% of GDP over three years as the government implements its medium-term revenue strategy. The additional tax revenue is used to increase public investment. However, only two-thirds of the investment spending is assumed to lead to be, to be effective, and the other one-third is considered to be lost. After three years, the stock of public capital remains at its current level, elevated level. So what does the balance sheet approach tell us? Well, the additional taxation can depress economic activity. The increase in investment more than offsets it. In the short run, the level of real GDP increases by two and three quarter percent relative to the baseline. That higher investment also induce, increases public sector capital and balance sheet net worth. In this case, it increases Indonesia's public sector capital by about 4% of GDP. The benefits continue in the long run. The higher level of the capital stock generates a permanent increase in the level of real GDP and potential GDP by one and a third percent relative to the baseline. This permanently higher economic activity, in turn, leads to continuous, albeit modest, improvements in the primary balance over time. As a result, the intertemporal component which is cumulative expenses and revenues over time, increases by 2.5% of GDP. In, the, in sum, Indonesia's public wealth, therefore, increases by a total of 6.5% of GDP from a tax finance public investment strategy. In the third stage, we can extend the analysis by considering alternative assumptions. For example, if the Indonesian authorities were to undertake structural reforms that increased investment efficiency, Indonesia's output and public wealth would increase even more. In the extreme case of perfect efficiency, that is, every rupiah spent on investment increases the capital stock, public capital stock by an equivalent amount, Indonesia's real GDP would increase permanently by 2% relative to the baseline, and total output and public wealth would increase by 10%. Returning to our example of the financially responsible individual, these individuals 
consider their assets, liabilities, and projections of their income and expenses when making major financial decisions. Why should we handicap fiscal policy by ignoring the public sector balance sheet? <clears throat> In Indonesia's case, it shows the gains to public wealth from a tax-financed public investment. The, using the balance sheet approach also can lead to better risk assessment, asset management, and fiscal policy decisions. Finally, public wealth, as we saw, leads to or can lead to lower borrowing costs and better macroeconomic outcomes, so it is worth keeping an eye on. Please, if you have time, visit the IMF website today and check out the IMF's October 2018 Fiscal Monitor if you're interested in finding out more about the public sector balance sheet approach, which is covered in depth. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, John, for your excellent presentation. So now we open the floor for questions. Yeah, the lady in the front. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. I think this is a very interesting um, thing that we should consider because um, all this time uh, people consider balance sheet as an accounting product instead of the, for uh, fiscal policy tools. And in Indonesia, we have been com uh, pre uh, preparing the balance sheet since 2004. But um, I think this is not only the case in Indonesia. Uh, I think not many countries has, has been using balance sheet for the fiscal policy making. And also the IMF has um, encouraged um, the compilation of the balance sheet using the GFSM even from 2001. Um, but uh, as uh, I mentioned before, uh, not many countries have been using it. So uh, what do you think should we do, I mean, to encourage the utilization of the public sector balance sheet in the fiscal uh, policy making? Instead of focusing only the short-term transaction, uh, I think this is very important for the sustainability and a long-term uh, perspective. And also, does uh, IMF have any plan or policy to encourage this in, uh, for the countries, Ex for example, using the Article 4 um, uh, uh, program and has been, um, uh, to encourage countries to compile a uh, public sector balance sheet. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, the an short answer is that yes, uh, the IMF is seeking to encourage the use of public sector balance sheets in fiscal policy analysis. I think the, the best example of that is the uh, 2018 Fiscal Monitor, which was launched today, which is dedicated to uh, public sector balance sheets, describing what they are, how to put them together, and how they can be used in, in analysis. Um, to facilitate this, as part of the exercise of, of putting the Fiscal Monitor together, the IMF's created a database of uh, public sector balance sheets from around the world, uh, which will eventually, uh, the idea is to eventually make that available to the public so that other countries can get a feel for what their neighbors may be doing or countries around the world are doing in terms of shining a light on, on public sector balance sheets and how they can be used. Of course, they're already used quite extensively in some countries such as New Zealand and Australia, and, and you mentioned that Indonesia itself has uh, done quite a, a lot of good work in putting together its public sector balance sheet. Um, so in sum, I'd say the main, main push right now is you know, the fiscal monitor and, and helping people understand the value and the benefit of, of uh, public sector balance sheets. The gentleman in the front. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, you will no doubt be aware of the pioneering work that um, uh, 
economist in New Zealand uh, did about 20 years ago, maybe a little more than 20 years ago, on the concept of public sector balance sheets. And, um, but that was New Zealand as an advanced economy, and that was more than 20 years ago. Right. Um, but in the context of a developing, uh, in a developing country, um, uh, sort of uh, possibilities and limitations, um, what the economists in New Zealand came up with, I'm sure you, you remember, was um, that an optimal fiscal policy um, really must aim for a zero net worth, public sector net worth. Uh, that's fine in theory, but in a developing country, is this really uh, a practical and um, useful kind of um, philosophical issue about the size and role of, mm -hmm. of the public sector? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, familiar with the work done in, in New Zealand. Um, I sent essentially two questions in there. One, uh, the idea of, of reaching a zero public net worth. Um, that is theoretical. In the long run, uh, there's no value to having any residual asset wealth for a country, uh, but that's on the assumption that somehow the country will eventually go away, right? So uh, yes, generally, the target is to encourage uh, more positive public wealth, in, at least in an intertemporal sense, in the, in the short to medium to longish run, uh, for the reasons that, as shown in the fiscal monitor, uh, the strength of public balance sheets can influence uh, the cost of financing for governments and, and macroeconomic outcomes. Uh, in the case of whether public sector balance sheets are really something that a developing country can pursue, um, in the fiscal monitor, we show that uh, public sector balance sheets can be built for countries that face data, significant data constraints. In the case, uh, the case study in there is done for the Gambia, uh, where a public sector balance sheet has been put together that looks at, uh, you know, not only central, subnational governments, but also uh, the public corporations. And uh, so it is possible, but it does take uh, quite a bit of work, and uh, some you have to make some plausible assumptions along the way to have a cohesive balance sheet. The lady in the front, and then the lady um, in the middle. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to your point about the fact that some assets may not be liquid. Um, it's easy to see that if you have natural capital, you could sell some of it and that would compensate for the debt you've acquired on the other side of the balance sheet. But in the case of infrastructure, uh, some of the investments may be sunk. Can you sell a road network, for instance? How do you deal with that aspect in this type of analysis? Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, uh, we deal with it by, there's actually another concept out there called net financial wealth which uh, looks at basically the difference between the financial assets that we listed first, which are generally considered the most liquid uh, assets a, a public sector will have. And uh, from that, you subtract the liabilities. Uh, this basically takes out of the equation the idea of these perhaps illiquid non-financial assets, such as local city streets or sewer systems. So when you look at an assessment of public sector balance sheets, certainly net worth is worth paying some attention to. But in terms of if you're looking to see what is the public sector's ability to possibly cover short-term financing needs, uh, a, perhaps a metric that's more relevant is this uh, net financial uh, worth metric. So uh, again, as with most analysis, uh, balance sheets and net worth are, are good starting points for the analysis, but uh, depending on what you're interested in, you may want to consider some other uh, metrics. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, before you uh, explaining about the impact of tax finance in the public investment. 
in your presentation. So I would like to ask you, the Indonesia's government has made a tax policy, maybe approximately in 2015, for instance, about the tax amnesty. So the policy, in your opinion, does it have a positive or negative impact to the public wealth, particularly for our Indonesian people? Thank you. Uh, the question of the tax amnesty, um, I'm sure the Indonesian authorities uh, took a long look at the best way uh, to encourage uh, greater tax collection over time. Um, and the idea behind that, obviously, is that by providing the amnesty, eventually taxpayers will come forward and, and, and pay their taxes. Um, I'm not completely familiar with the success of that strategy, but the Indonesian authorities have laid uh, a plan going forward uh, in, in the context of this medium-term revenue strategy to try to increase their tax revenues, which on a comparative basis are actually a little bit on the low side. So tax amnesty was kind of in the past, but looking ahead, they have a strategy uh, to, to boost uh, overall government revenue. I think there is a gentleman in the middle and then the gentleman in the front. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Yes. I'd like to follow up on the question uh, initially uh, raised by the lady to my extreme uh, left. Uh, and that has to do with your response with regards to her question in terms of net financial assets, uh, deducting the liabilities from the financial assets. There are times when some of the investment made in infrastructure, especially public infrastructure as it relates to buildings in, in, in third world countries, have some revenue potential to these uh, uh, investments. For example, leasing opportunities. So you might probably build a 20-story building, for example, and about four or five floors may be earmarked towards leasing so as to, to you know, accrue get revenue in the medium to long term, which will in term complement in terms of payment for the liabilities associated with those assets. In that case, will the net financial assets component of, 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 of analyzing the, your, your, your equation, the balance sheet equation, will it be a little bit too, I would say, less conservative if you factor the revenue potential in terms of, 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 of analyzing that picture? I just wanted to follow up on her question. Okay, uh, in the case of, this goes back to the concept that the balance sheet approach can lead to perhaps better management of public assets. What's essentially meant by that, in a way, is from a commercial sense, improving the yield on which the assets, the, that the assets generate. Public corporations are an obvious one where perhaps uh, the revenue from them can be increased by uh, setting more commercial return targets. In the case of your building, um, the leasing of the property and the revenues associated with that lease would actually appear more in the intertemporal component. This is the long run revenues and expenses. Uh, we would uh, pick up the idea that there is lease revenue coming in uh, from the building in the intertemporal component. However, it's not going to be reflected when you're looking just at the current balance sheet of the country uh, and the net financial worth uh, element that we talked about, because that's just going to consider what are your financial assets, such as cash on hand, holdings of marketable securities, perhaps loans that the government has, um, and then the liability side. So we do try to pick up the idea that government property can generate revenue over time, but that's largely going to fall into the intertemporal component rather than the net financial wealth. Again, I thank you for the presentation, and also I go in line with the previous questions raised by our colleagues, is that do you think that there is somehow stability ratios among all these somehow assist liabilities items, what would be the stability and the acceptable somehow relationship between uh, 
the financial assets versus the non-financial assets, the direct debt versus the other debt, what is the net worth ratios to the GDP that would be considered a stability ratio that we will be working or heading for might be different from the advanced economists to the somehow developing economics or emerging economies. Do you have any idea about this stability ratios as a benchmark, as benchmark that we will be working on? Thank you. Yeah, um, a lot of the work that uh, went behind the fiscal monitor uh, kind of remains a bit of a work in progress as well. Uh, we continue to explore some of the issues like what are potential thresholds or benchmarks that uh, countries should, could uh, possibly consider uh, in, in the context of balance sheet strength. Um, however, building out of the, the public sector balance sheet, you can also look at uh, other elements such as uh, net liquidity or net, uh, net current ratio or a net foreign exchange position. Um, those are some other uh, ratios that one can pull out of balance sheets and in, in the fiscal monitor we do that uh, for a couple of countries in the case, as a case study but uh, no still in the early days to develop actual thresholds so we are about to run out of time so we can take one more question but John will be available after this session so there is a gentleman um, in the back Um, thank you again, uh, John, for your great comprehensive uh, presentations on the public sector balance sheets. What really draws my attention is that the promise of the balance sheet, uh, or public balance sheet, uh, to replace the so-called maybe the uh, debt level or the uh, deficit uh, measurement that has been uh, widely used over time. Uh, in that case, like for instance, Indonesia is pretty much uh, uh, endowed with natural uh, resources here. Yeah. So how, how would you see this uh, in, in terms of the valuations? How do you take the discount factors? Because most of it also including the socials, uh, the so-called social uh, discount factors. Because I think this will be in parallel for, towards the commercial uh, uh, developments uh, later on. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, if I understand correctly, your question about uh, how Will the public sector balance sheet replace uh, the focus on debt levels and deficits? And number two, the question about the calculation of discount rates that go into the, calculate, the net present value calculation on revenues and expenses. Okay, on uh, the first question, uh, basically we view the balance sheet approach as a complement uh, to the current uh, efforts that focus on debt thresholds and deficits. Um, it's information that can uh, be valuable at times, for sure, in terms of, for the reasons I mentioned, transparency, asset management. Um, it also can show that uh, governments do have some assets at their disposal that help uh, cover financing costs. But as some of the questioners have pointed out, those assets, several of them, can be quite illiquid, right? So to count them as potentially offsetting the debt fully uh, is not well advised. On the discount rates that were behind the calculations, for Indonesia, um, the discount rates that go into the calculation of the inter intertemporal component were based on the effective interest rate that the general government had faced over the last five years. It was an average uh, that we used as the, the rate, uh, re average rate of interest that the public sector faces. For resource wealth, calculation uh, of that asset value, the interest uh, discount rates were actually based off of the 10-year um, uh, bond interest rate for Indonesia over a lo uh, long period of time, 15 years. And then because uh, the extraction of natural resources is rather uncertain, uh, what you don't actually know quite precisely what's in the ground or what can be found in the future, uh, 
we added three, uh, 300 basis points to, to the rate uh, of the 10-year bond. That was then used to discount back uh, the projection of cash flows from, from uh, essentially natural resources. John, any final thoughts for the audience? Yes. Um, so uh, as we've kind of discussed here, public sector balance sheets contain a wealth of information for policymakers, analysts, and the general public. In particular, they bring uh, the public sector uh, assets and also uh, public sector liabilities are larger than just uh, government debt. And these are things worth keeping in mind. Uh, in addition, pub the public sector balance sheet approach can lead to fiscal transparency, better risk management, uh, better use of public sector assets, and better policies. In conclusion, I'd just like to remind you, if you want to know more about this, please uh, check out the IMF website and the 2018 October Fiscal Monitor. Thank you.